You don't understand, it's after us. Everybody has that one game. You know the one. The game that basically encompasses a huge part of your childhood. The game that you played so much and explored so thoroughly, you can basically recite the entire game from beginning to end without fail. A game that you have poured so much time into, you basically have a set way of playing it pretty much every single time you go through it. I actually had two, because I was just that antisocial when I was growing up. The first was Super Mario RPG, a game that I owe my everlasting love of the RPG genre to. But the second game, and to me, one of Rareware's crowning achievements, was Banjo-Kazooie on the Nintendo 64. In my humble opinion, this is a game that took everything that Mario 64 innovated on and perfected it. And until Super Mario Odyssey came out late last year, there wasn't a single collectathon platformer that I had played that managed to elicit the same feeling of joy and excitement in me as this game right here. Just to be clear real quick, I am going to be using the Rare Replay version of the game, which is just the Xbox Live version, for the footage of this review. The two versions are pretty much the same, with some relatively major gameplay tweaks that we'll get into in the review proper. And man, I can't help but smile as soon as I boot this game up. The intro video, the animated N64 logo, not seen here because this is the Xbox version. Even the file select screen is just oozing with charm and personality. It just makes you feel good. So what's the story of the game? Well, not a lot to say there, as the narrative is about fairy tale level of complexity. The evil witch Gruntilda pulls a Snow White's evil queen, looking into her cauldron, Dingpot, to see if she is the most beautiful beast in all the land. But Dingpot shows her a young bear girl named Tootie, who is far cuter and prettier than her. Incensed by this, Gruntilda kidnaps the young bear, planning to steal her beauty, making herself beautiful and Tootie ugly. And so Tootie's big-hearted but slow-witted brother Banjo and their friend, the sarcastic and sharp-tongued Kazooie, set off to rescue her and stop Gruntilda. They're assisted in this endeavor by the knowledgeable Bottles the Mole, who teaches the duo new moves in several of the worlds and acts as the info dump whenever new mechanics are introduced, and Grunty's old magic teacher, the shaman Mumbo Jumbo, who appears in certain worlds and can transform the duo into different creatures and objects, allowing them to reach areas they couldn't before. And that's about as far as the plot goes. The main narrative gives you some good motivation to want to work towards the good ending, so the rather simple plot goes a long way in this instance. It's bolstered by the fact that most of our main characters have some pretty distinct personalities, for the most part. Banjo's primary character trait is his kind heart and empty head, which consequently makes him a little boring, but it makes for a good foil for Kazooie, who almost always has a snide remark whenever she talks to anyone and is typically rather greedy and self-serving. The other characters are pretty one-note. Mumbo Jumbo and Bottles, for example, only really have any big personality in the game when in verbal sparring matches with Kazooie. And while Mumbo has his speech pattern to make him unique, Bottles might as well be a disembodied voice telling you how to use specific moves. In fact, in some instances, he literally is just a disembodied voice explaining things to you. Grunty, however, is a fantastic villain. She's about as one note as a villain can get, she is gleefully, unapologetically evil and nasty, and even goes the extra mile by constantly taunting you as you walk about her lair, goading you, daring you to try and find her, making you feel all the more motivated to hunt her down and stop her. She manages to have a big impact on you, the player, without making any physical appearances again until near the end of the game. And the whole rhyming shtick she's got going on? Yet another part of the game that I find charming as hell. The individual characters in each world you visit, however, don't leave as big an impression. They're there to administer specific challenges or be set pieces or obstacles, but other than that, you remember them more for their designs rather than their personality. And to be fair, most of them have very memorable designs. Despite this, the writing of the game does have several strong points, such as the recurring joke about medium awareness, where characters will constantly point out that they're in a game, and they're fully aware of its mechanics. This was long before that sort of thing was a massive cliché, and while it does reoccur several times throughout the game, it isn't so often that it gets old or tiresome, and has plenty of other humorous British quips to throw at you besides. 
The game is a collectathon through and through, and as I said, it took most of the ideas presented in Super Mario 64 and refined it down to a point where the formula was almost perfected, to the point that its sequel actually did a lot that I found detrimental to the formula. Banjo-Tooie is still a good game, but I honestly don't think it's as good as the original, but that's a discussion for another day. The point of this game is to collect Jiggies. These golden jigsaw pieces are used to open up the entrances to new worlds, and you need a specific amount for each picture, and you also need enough to enter the lair of the final boss at the end of the game. Each of the nine worlds has ten jiggies total that you get for completing challenges scattered around, and also contained therein is a witch switch in each world that will cause a jiggy, or the path to a jiggy, to appear back in the massive hub world which in and of itself feels like a giant level that you slowly work your way through as the game progresses. Also in each level are five Jinjos, who you have to collect to earn one of the ten Jiggies, several Mumbo tokens, which you need to pay Mumbo Jumbo to activate his transformation spell in certain worlds, and two empty honeycomb pieces in each world that, when you collect six total, will increase your maximum life by one point. But most important of all are the musical notes, there are 100 of these suckers in each world, a total of 900 in the game, and while you need jiggies to open up each world, you need a certain number of notes in order to open the musical doors scattered throughout Grunty's lair in order to progress deeper inside. That might seem like a lot to keep track of, but it's really not. Unlike Banjo-Tooie, which was really too big for its own good, and Donkey Kong 64, which practically drowned you in the absolute mountain of collectibles you could get in the game, the amount of collectibles in Banjo-Kazooie is damn near perfect for the size of each world. Every world in the game feels a little larger than it actually is, but really they're all pretty small and compact, just broken up into very easily identifiable sections. For example, Bubble Gloop Swamp is basically laid out like a compass, with four different areas in each of the cardinal directions while Rusty Bucket Bay is just a dock with a big ship on it, and the size only really comes from entering each compartment and room on the ship. The only reason that Click Clock Woods feels as big as it does is because it's a very vertical level, with most of the challenges requiring you to climb up the trunk of the tree. Also, you have to go through the world four times in four different seasons to find everything, which also makes it seem a lot larger. But really, the size of the worlds is pretty manageable, making them easy to explore and find most of the collectibles. Sometimes the challenges you have to complete, especially later in the game, are not as telegraphed as they could be, but the game does encourage you to try a lot of different things in the hopes of finding solutions for what you need to do. To assist in this, you have an impressively large move pool right from the start of the game. The opening tutorial area gives you a good idea for the size and scale of the game, and the tutorial sections on the various moves that you can do make it very easy to understand all of the game's mechanics. And also, this is a feature that I feel should be mandatory in every game, you have the ability to skip the tutorial if you don't want to be taught the moves or you already know and just want to get to the game. But even then, the tutorial area rewards you for practicing these moves, allowing you to learn them in a very controlled and relatively safe environment, where if you master each ability, you can find and gather six empty honeycomb pieces, enough to net you an extra hit point right at the start of the game. And that arsenal only gets larger as the game goes on, as you learn at least one new move from Mumbo's Mountain all the way up to Gobi's Valley. Most of these moves are pretty cool, from the Talon Trot that allows you to walk up steep slopes and get around faster, to the ability to shoot eggs out of your mouth and fart them out your back end. Stay classy, Rare. To even turning completely invincible so long as you have golden feathers to power the move, you have a very impressive and versatile move set. Unfortunately, as fun as many of these moves can be, this is also where one of the game's weaknesses shows the hardest. A lot of these moves that you learn are very situational, especially the ones you learn later on, and even one or two of the ones that you get at the beginning. Take the Beak Barge, for example, which even gets its own section in the tutorial. It's presented as a powerful melee attack, but because of its charging nature, it's actually very impractical to use as an attack against an enemy. Instead, for a majority of the game, it's only used to bust open doors or gates that aren't affected by your other moves or don't have a switch to open them up. And in combat, your regular jump attack or your forward roll is much more effective. 
The power-up centric moves you get are probably the worst of it though. The boots you get in Bubble Gloop Swamp, for example, are only used in areas where you need to walk through hazardous material, or the Speed Shoes, which are only used for a few specific challenges that focus on racing against other characters or against the clock. Because of their situational nature, they feel pretty tacked on. Also, while the Talon Trot is really useful, since you'll be using it to get pretty much everywhere, that means you'll be listening to this pretty often. <laughs> There's also a couple of other things about the game's design that can be pretty annoying, the biggest one being the end game requirements. I love this game's penultimate challenge. The board game is hilarious and a great challenge to see just how much you were paying attention to the game, and the fake out ending still makes me laugh when it happens. But then you're sent back into the fray to fight Gruntilda one last time, in what is admittedly a great marathon boss fight and a wonderful capstone for the end of the game. But the totals that you need to reach it for this sort of game are pretty strict. In order to access the final battle against Gruntilda, you need at least 810 notes and 94 jiggies. I remind you that 100% completion in this game calls for 900 notes and 100 jiggies. And that's just the bare minimum. If you want to access all the extra stuff before the final boss fight, such as giant feathers and eggs that will fully replenish your ammunition, or a small honeycomb picture that will double your life meter, you'll need at least 882 notes and 98 jiggies. This is pretty damn strict in terms of prerequisites just to see the end of the game, especially for the kids that this game was targeting at the time. And unless you've already completely mastered the game, or are playing with a guide, there are a number of challenges that are pretty annoying your first time through, especially some of the minigames and races where the game relies on rubber banding AI to keep it challenging. Compare that to Super Mario 64, where you only needed 70 of the 120 Power Stars available to complete the game, giving you a comfortable 50 star difference if you didn't feel like pushing yourself to 100%. Even Banjo-Tooie, which I don't find to be as fun as the original game, softened up considerably on what was required to finish it, eliminating notes as a prerequisite for continuing instead making them currency for learning new moves and only requiring 70 of the 90 jiggies to reach the final boss. Of course, that's only one point in Tui's favor, and it still had the big problem of massive amounts of backtracking, the seed of which you could see here, and it was a very very annoying out of place seed. In Banjo-Kazooie, you can pretty much complete every single world your first time through, and there's never a need to backtrack if you know where everything is with the main exception being Freeze-Z Peak, which has a single Jiggy that is impossible to get your first time here, that being the second race against Boggy. You have to race him on foot, and even using the Talon Trot, he will very easily outpace you right at the beginning. The only way to actually beat him is to go to the world after this, Gobi's Valley, and learn the Speed Shoes, the last and most situational move in the entire game, and then go back to Freeze Easy Peak and use those in order to keep up with him. And man, if you're playing the original N64 version and are going for everything, you'd better make damn sure you cleaned out everything else in that world, because if you didn't, well... This does lead into the biggest annoyance of Banjo-Kazooie's design, at least for the original version. See, in the cartridge version, whenever you leave a world or whenever you lose a life, everything in that world resets. Everything. Not just the enemies, but also most of the barriers you've broken, all of the notes reappear, and all of the Jinjos are put back in their original spots as well. Meaning if you didn't find all the Jinjos or collect all 100 notes, you need to scour the entire world again to recollect everything, as the notes are only counted towards your total when you beat your best score for each world. There is nothing more frustrating and infuriating than collecting almost everything in a world like, say, Rusty Bucket Bay, only to misstep or mistime one jump while exploring the inside of the ship and have to do it all over again. Now thankfully, the Xbox version of the game fixed this problem so that all Jinjos and notes you collect stay with you forever, making death much less of a penalty than it was before though certain barriers and aspects of each world will still reset after you die or leave in return. This is most notable in Treasure Trove Cove, where you have to keep draining the lake every time you come back in order to enter the secret cheat codes that you get from Cheeto the Spellbook. 
This version, though, does have a few little things that bug me as well. While it runs much smoother than the original, I swear that some of the cutscenes and dialogue scenes are really mistimed in this version. Like the text scrolls faster than it did before, and there are times when I swear there are long pauses where there weren't any before. And then there's this hiccup that happens during the first scene of the game. You gonna move or... Uh, oh, there we go. What's more, there are some strange things about the control, too. The control in this game is great, pretty much one-to-one -one with the original, which also had tight responsive controls that I really didn't have much of a problem with, except for the occasional weirdness that came with trying to run and jump on slippery surfaces. That, that was a nightmare. But the Xbox version changed some small things that are just really noticeable, as both a fan of the original and someone who expected certain changes to help the game fit in a bit more with the modern landscape. The biggest culprit of this is the camera controls. On the Nintendo 64 version, camera controls were handled with the C buttons, allowing you to move the camera left and right at set intervals, while pressing the up and down buttons would cause it to zoom in or out but there was no way to control the camera's vertical axis. In the remake, while moving the camera left and right is now much smoother, there's still no way to manually control the camera's vertical axis. Instead, moving the right stick up and down merely causes it to zoom in and out, instead of moving it up and down like you would expect. And it's a little disorienting, to say the least. What's more, it can also get a bit annoying with how you activate certain moves. In the original game, to activate the Talon Trot or Wonderwing moves, or to shoot or fart out eggs, you would hold down the Z button and then hit the corresponding C button. While you were doing this, the camera didn't move. The remake helps with this by mapping egg shooting to some of the unused face buttons, and the Talon Trot is activated by holding down the left and right triggers. Wonderwing, though? You crouch down and then tap the right stick to the right, which consequently also causes the camera to spin to the right. In some instances, this is fine, as in some arenas, for example, the camera remains fixed, but in high-stress situations where you're trying to activate your life-saving move, or just trying to be really accurate with where you're moving after activating it, it can really throw you off, which is doubly annoying because activating and maintaining the Wonder Wing requires you to use Golden Feathers, a resource that is relatively uncommon to find laying around. You almost never find more than one or two at a time, and unless you find Cheeto the Spellbook much later in the game, in three different locations no less, you have a very limited amount that you can carry at any given time. But all of these instances only stick out because the rest of the game is so good, and even with a more major annoyance like having to recollect everything in the N64 version, they remain just that, annoyances, and they never get so bad as to lead to absolute frustration. Man, we're already this far into the review and I haven't even talked about the soundtrack and sound design, which is also friggin' brilliant. Grant Kirkhope is the man to praise for this, and every sound in this game is exquisite. The game actually pulls a Mario World trick, where pretty much every single main song in the game is basically just a remix of the main theme, with a different timing, instrumentation, or genre. And it's amazing how easy it is to forget it when you're just listening to the music. I also think it's important to note that even the small jingles or the sounds you hear from picking up individual items is thrilling and fun, with every single one being instantly discernible and unmistakable. And the voices in this game, my goodness, the voices in this game. or rather the random sounds masquerading as voices. Every character in this game sounds unique and is given a unique voice, but whether you find the garbled randomly assembled sounds they make charming or annoying is totally up to personal preference. 
but I personally think that it lands more on the charming side. And it's a good thing too, as all of the music, voices, and sound effects make up an entire category of questions you can be asked during the quiz game segment near the end of the game. The game also looks pretty good too, given its age. The Xbox version doesn't actually change too much, mostly smoothing down the sharp angled polygons and giving everything a very light facelift. But it's amazing that the game still looks as nice as it does, considering that it's 20 years old at this point. Then again, most games that adopted a more cartoonish or exaggerated art style tend to have a longer shelf life than something that was made to look more realistic. Isn't that right, Resident Evil? <laughs> this game is just great, and if you haven't played it at all, well, you probably didn't grow up with a Nintendo 64 then. Like I said at the beginning, everything that Super Mario 64 helped to introduce to gaming in 1996 this game refined to excellence in 1998, and I can't recommend it enough. While I would recommend playing the original hardware for a more authentic experience, the Xbox version, available for download on Xbox Live, or as a download through the Rare Replay Collection, is probably the most definitive way of playing the game, as it fixes the one biggest issue that the original version had, and the few small nitpicks I have with it do nothing to take away from my enjoyment. The game is, to me, Rare Incarnate, and I would love to see them return to their classic wheelhouse down the line. No offense to Sea of Thieves, it does look interesting, but it's definitely not my cup of tea because I prefer single-player experiences, i.e. I'm one of those guys that big publishers says don't exist anymore. Just, Rare, if you ever do get the chance to make a game like this again, don't go overboard, eh? Sometimes less is better, and I think this game is a good example of that. See you all next time, everyone. Oh!